Well, hello, church. We're coming to you again for another uh, Wednesday night uh, video. And uh, we decided to do things a little different this time rather than the four of us just sitting around talking things amongst ourselves. Uh, we're going to do something a little different. Um, one of the things is we're going to do an actual Bible study. Uh, you know, we've been thinking everybody being at home and having all this time uh, to themselves right now, uh, it's easy to um, get caught up in wasting time doing nothing. And that's one of the things, I mean, even for myself, I've had to fight against. I mean, it is so easy to get on your phone and just look at stupid videos for hours. And then you sit there and go, good grief, where did all that time go that I just absolutely wasted? And uh, so we want you to be able to fill your time with actual productive things. And so one of the things is spending time in the Word, in the Bible. And if you're going to do that, I um, want you to know how to read the Bible the way that I believe God intended for it to be read. Um, and so what we're going to do here is go through um, really what I teach in the Believe class on Wednesday nights on uh, how to read the Bible through the lens of the gospel. Um, those that have taken it before in the past, uh, many of them have said they would like to take it again just to get some of that stuff to start uh, sinking in a little better. Plus, Casey and Jennifer, they've wanted to be able to take that, but because they have things going on on Wednesday night too, they haven't been able to do that. And so we just thought, well, let's do that. And so we're going to spend the next couple weeks uh, going through how to read the Bible reading it through the lens of the gospel, how to find Jesus and everything that you read in there. So we're going to do that. We're also going to be recording our personal testimonies. Some people have suggested that. And so beginning next week, we'll have not just one video, but two. We'll have one of this Bible study, and then we'll have another one with one of us giving our testimony. And then the following week, there'll be two more, the next session on this, and then somebody else giving their testimony. We'll have them on Facebook and on YouTube, so uh, you can look forward to that. One other thing we want to let y'all know, uh, obviously last Sunday, plans didn't go according to the way we wanted them to, as far as having our parking lot service for um, the services for Easter. Um, weren't able to do that because of the weather, but there were so many people who were looking forward to that. We still want to do that. And so not this coming Sunday, but the next, we're looking at having another or, or trying again to have a parking lot service. This Sunday, there's a, a chance of rain again. And so we didn't want to uh, do that this Sunday. So the following Sunday, hopefully if the weather is good, looks like it's going to be good, then we'll shoot for that. But one of the things that we did in preparing for that service was get the radio transmitter to be able to broadcast a service live out in the parking lot. And so if you want to come up here any Sunday and just sit in the parking lot and listen to the service through uh, your radio, you can do that any Sunday. You don't have to wait for us to have a parking lot service or anything like that. There were a few people who did come up here last Sunday and did that. They said it sounded great coming through the radio and it was good just being on the church property. So if you want to do that, you're able to as well. Okay, anybody have anything else you think we need to go over? Okay, we're going to do this kind of, even though I'm going to mainly be leading it, we'll do it as a discussion top. Anytime y'all have a question that you want to throw in, feel free to do that. So let's get into learning how to read and study and interpret the Bible the way that I believe God intended to. Uh, they're going to be following along in, in a guide here, some notes. And if you want one of these as well to be able to follow along at home, just uh, call the office, send an email to Loretta again, that Loretta Rodriguez 2019 at gmail.com, and uh, give us your email, and we will send you these so that you can follow along as well. Um, so when it, they say that to, to really be able to retain something, when you employ three things, you're hearing it, you're saying it and you're writing it down, that's when things really begin to sink in and you don't forget it as easy. So um, you got at least two of those um, providing you with that by hearing me teaching it and writing it down. And if you're there at home by yourself or with anybody else, you can even say it out loud to yourself as well. 
Uh, we'll go around and I'll have each one of them repeat everything I say today so that we I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, all right, well, let's get into it. Looking at the Bible. It'd be good if I had mine with me here since that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, but uh, first thing I want to do, though, is dispel some misconceptions about the Bible and talk about what the Bible is not. I know growing up, we've heard all kinds of different things. The Bible is this, the Bible is that. And uh, so there, the first blank there, the Bible is not a good luck charm. Um, it's not a good luck charm. I know we've heard stories of, you know, there's the, the popular story about a, a soldier who is fighting and an enemy bullet hit him in the chest, but it didn't do anything because he had the New Testament uh, there in his front pocket and the bullet stopped that because the Bible protected him. Uh, I don't doubt that that actually happened, but that is not the purpose of God's Word. It is not a good luck charm. Um, some people have it in their vehicles thinking that it's going to protect them from a crash. Uh, some people have them just sitting on their coffee table or on their nightstand. They never open it up, but they think just have that Bible there, it's going to protect them from evil spirits or anything like that. That is not what the Bible is. It is not a good luck charm. It is not supposed to be viewed like that. If you view the Bible like that, that is really idolatry because what you're doing is giving and assigning power to an inanimate object. There is nothing powerful about this leather, the cardboard, the paper, and the ink here. Nothing supernatural about this at all. The only way supernatural power is released from this is when we are reading it, is when we are speaking it. And so don't treat the Bible as an idol. It's not a good luck charm. Second thing the Bible is not, and this is a popular one, and you've heard me say this before, the, the Bible is not an owner's manual. You know, we hear that all the time. This is your owner's manual for life. Well, no, it's not. Um, yes, there are instructions in here. Uh, that tell us how we should live as Christians, but it shouldn't be viewed from, from that mentality. And the reason why I say that is a couple reasons. Number one, when is the only time we ever really read an owner's manual? When we don't know how to do something. Yeah. What, what's the most read section of an owner's manual? Troubleshooting. Troubleshooting. We only pull out an owner's manual when we have a problem with something. And so uh, that's exactly how a lot of people, the only time they ever read the Bible. If I have a problem in my life, well, let me go find out uh, what the Bible says about this problem that I'm having, which is okay, but that shouldn't be the only thing it's used for. And so uh, it, it's not that. Another reason why it's not an owner's manual is because, well, how many of y'all have owner's manuals in your house? You keep them somewhere, like a section where you got your owner's manuals. How many of you can name the author of any of those owner's manuals? No, none of us can. We, we, we don't know who wrote these owner's manuals because you don't read an owner's manual in order to get to know the author. Right. Well, that's the whole purpose of the Bible. It is us to get to know God. This is about God. If we view this as an instruction manual, then we make the Bible about us. Right. And it's simply not. <clears throat> this is about God. And so don't buy into this thing that the Bible is an owner, owner's manual manual. And then that is the third thing. The Bible is not about us. Uh, if you're doing that, if you put you, if you make the Bible about you, you're going to be missing the whole point of it. Uh, we have a tendency to make ourselves the heroes of every story, make the focus of everything in the Bible about us. But if you do that, you're going to be way off. It's not about us. It's about God. So what is it then? Next thing there in the notes, the Bible is God's story of the redemption of creation through Jesus. It is God's story of the redemption of creation through Jesus. And the main thing to know there is that it is God's story. The Bible isn't just a collection of individual stories in and of themselves, but each of those individual stories make up one big story. And so one word that you'll hear me say often during all this is meta narrative which is there in your notes there. Meta-narrative simply means big story. The big story, the meta-narrative, stands above all the other individual stories. And I'll just go ahead and, and let you in on something that Jesus is the story. 
right? I mean, he is the story of the Bible. And one of the neat things about that, the next point, is that being in him then means that we get to be a part of the story. And that's so neat to realize that you are a part of God's story, being in Christ. And we'll flesh out more what that means as we go on. You know, stories are powerful. Uh, everybody loves a good story, and God is the ultimate storyteller. And we can even see this aspect about God in Jesus. You know, Colossians 1.15 says that Jesus is the in image of the invisible God. And in verse 9 of chapter 2, it says, In him the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And so Jesus isn't just an expression of God. He is the expression of God to, hum to humanity. Everything intended that God intended for us to know about him is seen in Jesus. And one of the things that we see about Jesus, and so therefore about God, is that he's a storyteller. Because Jesus was always using parables. He was telling stories in order to get his point across because we were made to respond to stories. That's how God made us. And so he's a storyteller. And so in order to be able to understand the Bible better, it has to be read as one big story. And whatever you are reading there, it's important to know which part of the story you're actually in. Um, every story, you'll, you'll read this in English class, has five essential parts to it. In fact, my youngest daughter, Hope, last year she came home with some homework and they were learning in their writing or reading class, something like that. They were learning the parts of a story, and she wanted me to help her memorize these five parts. And they were the exact five parts that I talk about in this Bible study. And uh, so in, in old uh, German back in the 1700s actually came up with this. But the thing is, he, he didn't invent this. He just discovered something God had already invented himself. It's like Sir Isaac Newton. He didn't invent gravity. He just discovered what God had already made. So did this, uh, in, this German guy. And so the five parts of the story are this. The first one is the exposition. In the exposition, there are three main things that are introduced. You have the setting the main characters, and the conflict. There is a conflict that is introduced into the story in the exposition there. And then the second part is called the rising action. The rising action describes how the story continues with this conflict that was introduced. And the main thing about it is that it, it, it talks about the failed attempts to solve the conflict. And so this conflict is introduced, and then the rising action talks about how they try to solve the conflict and all the ways that it didn't work, it failed. And then the third part is really the most important part, and that is the climax. That's the turning point of the story. The climax usually involves a hero who comes and solves the conflict once and for all. And then the action of that hero, the climax, it changes the story, and it also determines the outcome. These are the things that you learn, in, not in a Bible class, but in an English class, actually. And then after the climax is the falling action. This part tells how the story changed now that the conflict has been resolved. How the story has changed now the conflict has been resolved. Am I going too fast with y'all? If I am, y'all stop and I'll repeat something. And then finally, the fifth part of the story is the resolution, or sometimes called the conclusion. The resolution summarizes the climax, and then it brings the story to an end. So those are the five parts to every story. If you want to tell a good story, if you want to write a good story, it's very important that you have those five parts in there. Now, here's the neat thing. We're going to take that model and lay it over God's big story of the Bible. And so the first part, the exposition, we find in the first three chapters of Genesis. 
So in those first three, three chapters, you have those three things that the exposition introduces. You have, first of all, you have the setting, which is the created world. The created world, that is the stage on which God's story is going to be played out. You also have the introduction of the main characters. Who are they? Well, the very first verse, in the beginning, God. God is the main character there, but you also have the introduction of Adam and Eve, and so you've got mankind as the other main character. But there's one more. That's not the only two characters in this story. Who's the other one? Huh? The serpent. The serpent, right. Satan. Satan is introduced here. He is the antagonist, the opposition to the hero. And when he arrives, he brings the other element of the exposition. He brings the conflict with him. <clears throat> the, conflict, the conflict is separation from God. I mean, Adam and Eve, they rebelled against God, and the consequences of that are that they were separated from him. And that is the conflict in the story. They started out united with him in fellowship. The antagonist came, he introduced a conflict, and the result of that conflict is they are now separated from God. Um, Genesis 3-7, again, you know, talks about the eyes of both of them were open, which meant their spiritual eyes were closed and their natural eyes were open. They could no longer see things the way that God did. Okay, and then from Genesis 3 all the way to the book of Malachi, which is the rest of the Old Testament, that is the rising action of the story. Remember what we said about that. They are failed attempts to solve the conflict. The conflict, separation from God, limited in our own understanding, causes mankind to become more and more corrupt. And so Noah comes along, and it seems like he's going to provide the way that he's going to solve the conflict. It's God is going to provide a big do-over. I mean, how many of you love do-overs? I mean, it would be nice to have a big do-over every now and then, right? And it seemed like that's what was going on with Noah, and that was going to solve the problem, but that didn't solve anything. I mean, mankind continued to get more and more corrupt. And then we have Abraham who arrives on the scene, and he seems to make some great strides into solving the conflict. He's a man that God chooses to and calls out to be the leader of a great nation, a nation of people that God would have for himself. And Abraham learns that faith, is going to play a key role towards solving the resolution. And so now hope is once again restored in the people. And since Abraham is the father of God's people, then maybe being of the right bloodline is going to solve the problem. And so if we could just be a part of this group of people, then we are going to be united back with God and that will solve the conflict. But nope, that doesn't do it either. And then comes Moses. And now we're getting somewhere because through Moses, God gives the people his law. And so you've got God's law there given through Moses. And so finally, no more guessing, right? I mean, we've got it written in stone. Ten simple commands on how to resolve the conflict, how to get that relationship back with God. How easy can that be, man? Simple. We can do these ten things, but no. We, huh? Right. The law was the owner's manual, right? The owner's manual didn't work. The reason why God gave it in the first place was to show that we couldn't do it. Um, so there's another failed attempt at solving the conflict. The story continues through Joshua and Judges, and then we come to David. David comes along and gives the people a hope like they had never had before. He is someone that God handpicks and even calls a man after his own heart. And in your notes there, David is the righteous king. Because David leads Israel into its glorious days, the best years of Israel's life. And now it appears that all is right in the world, that all is right with God. It now appears that the conflict has been resolved. It's like this utopia area that they are in right now, but the happy times don't last forever. David sins, David dies, the kingdom is split, and the people are sent into bondage. Other kings continue, and they lead a divided kingdom. None of them are able to fix the problem. Despair and hopelessness begins to set in, and then comes the prophets. And they begin to speak of something God was going to do, something so big, so other than, so cataclysmic, 
that it was hard for them to even describe it in their limited vocabulary and understanding. And then hope starts to rise again. But should they dare believe? I mean, so many times their hope was just dashed once they thought the conflict had been resolved and they're afraid of the failure and the disappointment again. But could this be different? And then God just completely goes silent for 400 years. It's like there's this big cliffhanger in the story, as if all of creation held its breath. And so if, the Bible, if this was a TV series, we would get to the end of Malachi, and then the words up on the screen would say, to be continued. And you'd have to wait a whole year, like the Star Wars series or whatever, to wait for the next thing to come out. And finally it does. After this big dramatic pause, we have the climax. And the climax of God's story goes from the book of Matthew to the second chapter of Acts. A hero comes. And who is that hero? Jesus. Jesus. That's right. He decisively, once and for all, solves the conflict. He absolutely changes everything and determines the outcome. And in Mark's record of the climax, he records Jesus' first words in verse 15 of saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. That, that's a key verse right there that we're going to come back to several times during this whole study. But it, it's interesting there that he said the time is fulfilled. What did he mean by that? Well, he meant that the time that history had been waiting on, the time that all of history had been about, had come. And what that means then is the Old Testament cannot be fully understood without Jesus nor can Jesus be fully understood without the Old Testament. It has everything to do with him. You know, there's this belief out there that says, well, now that Jesus has come to fulfill everything in the Old Testament, we don't need that anymore, that it's obsolete. But that's not true. I mean, there are so many things in there we can read and learn about Jesus and what it means to be in him that we don't even find in the New Testament. You know, and, and we'll, we'll discover some of that as we go through here. Galatians 4, 4 through 6 is an awesome verse that shows us how Jesus is the climax of the story. And it says this, But when the fullness of time came, that's that, again, the fulfillment, the time that all of history had been waiting on, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were the, under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And there it is. The conflict resolved. What was the conflict? Separation. Separation from God. What did Jesus do? Enabled us to receive the adoption as sons. That conflict has been resolved in Jesus. No longer separated from God, but permanently adopted by him. Through Jesus, we are brought back in. Through Jesus, uh, we are brought back into the garden. The life, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus is the climax of the story. All right, any questions before we get on to the next part? Making sense? All right. Then after the climax, the fourth part of the story is the falling action. How the story changed now that the conflict has been resolved. And the conflict of God's story goes from the second chapter of Acts to the book of Jude. Now that the conflict has been resolved, now what? What do we do? How do we live? I mean, we've lived for so long under the law, so long without this conflict being resolved. Now that it has been resolved, what do we do with this? Because Jesus' death ushered in a whole new covenant, yeah. right, that we now have with God. Um, Jeremiah 31, I'll read that a prophecy of what God was going to do. Jeremiah 31, 31, he said, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is a covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. I will be their God. They shall be my people. 
They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. I mean, so much different than the old covenant. The old covenant was this external thing written on stone that you had to look at and check off, see how you measured up. But the new covenant, God's law, wouldn't be an external thing. It would be internal. It would be written on our hearts. We would know him personally, not have to go to a priest or go to somebody else in order to know God, <clears throat> excuse me, in order to know God, but we would know him personally. Um, and so the falling action in God's story, the next thing there in your guide is in the notes, is learning to live under the new covenant. Learning to live under a new covenant requires some adjustment. So think of it in terms of marriage. When you get married, you enter into a new covenant, don't you? Mm -hmm. I mean, the covenant you lived under before is basically one with yourself. You didn't have anybody else to think of. And that was the one thing that really hit me the most our first year of marriage was to discover how selfish I was. I mean, that shocked me because I would never thought of myself as a selfish person. But it was because for 25 years, I never had to think about anybody else, you know. And so it was just naturally to be self-centered. But now all of a sudden there's this other person in the picture and I can't just think about myself anymore. I got somebody else to think of. And so you can't live like you used to and still expect things to work good in this marriage covenant. You have to make some adjustments in order for this new covenant to work right. Um, but the thing is, if you love your spouse, you're happy to make those adjustments, aren't you? Yeah. I mean, I want to make changes to the way I lived before because I love my wife and I want these things uh, to be done. Um, you're happy to make those changes because you're motivated by love. But if you enter a marriage still wanting to live like you were when you were single, there's going to be conflict. That covenant's not going to work out very well. There's going to be turbulence in the transition. Well, the same is true with God. If we try to live according to old covenant principles under this new covenant that we have in him, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be some turbulence in that it just won't work and that's exactly what jesus was talking about when he said you can't pour new wine into old wine skins mm -hmm. it's, it's not going to work it's going to bust it's going to spill out all over the place and so from acts to jude is the following action how the story has changed this is how we adjust our lives to live under this new covenant that god has given us now and then from the book of revelation then in the book of Revelation, we have the resolution or conclusion. Now, I know we like to think, and probably a lot of us have been taught, that the entire book of Revelation is just a prophetic vision of what's going to happen in the future. But the truth is, the majority of Revelation is a summing up of what Jesus has already accomplished. And when you read Revelation from that perspective, it, it really makes a whole lot more sense to me. People are always dissecting it in order to figure out what's going to happen in the future. But like I said, it's really summing up what Jesus has already done, which is what the conclusion, the fifth part of the story does. It says it, it summarizes the, the climax. Um, and we'll talk about that more later as we go. But you do also have the future conclusion as well. I mean, there is the prophetic part in there of what's going to happen in the future, the way that the story is going to end, the way that it's going to come to completion. In, uh, it's interesting that in chapter 21 of Revelation, John said that he saw a new Jerusalem coming down, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't us going up to heaven. It was heaven coming down to earth which really mimic what Jesus said, pray, let it, things be done here as they are there. Let your will be done here. Let heaven come down here. And in the end, that's what's going to happen. It's the new being imposed onto the old. And you also got the angel saying God's tabernacle will be among men. He is coming to them and he will be with them. Jesus is going to return and restore all things to himself. All the created order is going to be returned back to its original state 
and mankind will once again be in perfect communion with him forever. He's just going to return everything the, ba the way it was originally intended to be. But make no mistake about it, even though the end is going to be glorious, nothing will happen in the future that will trump or be bigger than or better than what Jesus has already accomplished. Yeah. There's only one climax to the story. Yeah. There's not two. And there's Jesus is the climax. Whatever happens in the future will have everything to do with what Jesus has already accomplished at the cross. Because um, again, the climax determines the outcome. So that's God's story laid out over the Bible. Okay. So why is it important for us to be able to view the Bible this way as one big story? There's a couple reasons. For one, many people still do look at the Bible like an owner's manual, trying to find what are the instructions that I need to follow in order to make my life better. And because they view the whole Bible as an instruction manual, they'll even go into the Old Testament and pull out something there and say, well, because it says to do this, then, then I need to follow that. Uh, so, for instance, um, and people use this all the time, the reason why uh, Christians should not get tattoos is because there's a verse in the Old Testament in the law that says don't mark your bodies the way the pagans did, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if you're just going to pick that verse, you're going to have to pick the other verses around it, too. The verses around that talk about your hair not being a certain length or cutting it this way or cutting your beard a certain way. Yeah, not shaving. And so you can't just cherry pick the, the instructions that, that you want to police or enforce and not do the other ones. But that's not the purpose of those because what was one of the characteristics about the rising action? There were failed attempts right. at solving the conflict. And so why would you go back and try to use a failed attempt when it didn't solve the conflict? Like you're going to solve something with it now. It just doesn't work. If it failed to work back then, it's going to fail to work now too. Another reason is because, you know, we often look at these Old Testament characters as examples of how to model our lives after and so some of you may be involved in a, a character study on, you know, a character from the Old Testament. Um, and so they'll say, this is how Ruth was. Here's some characteristics of David. And because David was like this, we need to emulate our lives after David. We need to be a Ruth and this and that. But that, again, that makes us, it makes the story about us. Mm -hmm. Those characters in those stories aren't there to point us to them so that we can model our lives after them. They're there to point us to Jesus, right. to model our lives after him, not them. And it's really interesting to me that anybody would want to do a character study on David. They're just <laughs> going to pick out the few good parts of him, completely live out the adultery and the murder and everything else. It's like, no, we're just going to copy this part. Well, how about copy somebody that didn't have any of those flaws? You know, let's, let's look to Jesus right. instead of some of these another failed human being. Um, I even wrote up here that um, the peace they did experience under David was through violent means. Yeah. It was through violence and not through love and peace. And so yeah. even, even the little bit of peace that they thought they had carved out for themselves at that time was violent. Yeah, which means it wouldn't last very long. And it's, it was insufficient. It was... it. Again, it was based more on happiness. It was circumstantial. That's right. Right? That peace all had yeah. to do with the absence of conflict. But true peace in God is there even when there is conflict. Yeah. Right? So it was it was a worldly peace and not a not a Christ centered, Holy Spirit driven peace. Um, so I'll give an example of what the Old Testament heroes are there for so uh, let's take David for instance in the story of David and Goliath uh, how many times have you heard that story a lesson taught on that story and the main lesson being that as long as you have God on your side you can kill any giant that comes at you right, That's right. and they're like yeah man and it pumps you up and it gets you motivated and but the, uh, if I'm going to be honest, I'm sure we all would, 
we've all had giants come in our lives that have kicked my butt. Yeah, right. right? Yep. They have defeated me. I have been defeated by giants. And so if the lesson in that is God, you will kill any giant that comes at you if God is on your side, then what happened in those instances when the giant got me? Does that mean God wasn't on my side? Or no, God's always on my side, right? Okay, then what was wrong there? Well, it must have been something I did wrong. So now the focus is on you. What did I do wrong? Well, that's not the, what that story is about. Again, we are not the hero of the story. Jesus is the hero of the story. Um, Jesus was the unlikely hero through unconventional means, just like David killed the giant of sin. That's what he did, right? You know who we are in the story? You want to guess who we are? We are in the story, but we're not David. We're not the hero. We're the army shaking in their boots over on the sideline, too afraid to get out there in the battlefield. But when did the army actually engage in the fight? It was when they saw the hero achieve that victory. When they saw David kill the giant, that's what motivated them to jump into the battle then. And so it is only when we see Jesus for who he is and understand what he has done and the victory that he has won, then that's our motivation to engage in this life that he has mm -hmm. called us to do. And so when we make Jesus the center of the story, it changes our hearts. It changes our affection towards him and gets our eyes off, off of us and onto him. So that's why we don't, we don't use uh, characters in the Old Testament as uh, you know, moral lessons for us to follow. We try to figure out well, what are these characters telling us about Jesus? How are they pointing us uh, to him? Um, there's another literary term that's used in storytelling that you may remember in school. It's called foreshadowing. A foreshadowing of a story gives a hint as to what's, what's coming later. Nearly every bit of the Old Testament is nothing but a foreshadow of the climax. God was telegraphing what he was going to do through Jesus, giving these hints as, as to what was going to come. So we'll go through some of the, the things that we described in the Old Testament earlier. Uh, the story of Noah, not just about a man who is faithful to God and did something radical in order to save his family from the destruction of the flood. Noah was a foreshadow of Jesus who did something radical that would save his people from the flood of God's wrath. Abraham was a foreshadow of Jesus who would be the father of a great nation of Christians. They would be identified not by their Hebrew blood, but by his blood that was shed for them on the cross. Paul says, not a circumcision of the flesh would we be known as the people of God, but by the circumcision of our hearts. Uh, Moses wasn't just about uh, leading the Hebrew people out of the slavery in Egypt into a promised physical land. He was a foreshadow of Jesus, the ultimate let my people go savior who led his people out of the bondage, the slavery of sin, into the promised land of salvation. The story of David, again, wasn't just about the best uh, king Israel ever had. He was the foreshadow of the king of kings who would rule over an everlasting kingdom. The judges in the Old Testament were a foreshadow of Jesus as the ultimate judge. The entire Old Testament was pointing to the climax of the story, and nearly the entire New Testament points back to the climax of the story. You will not be able to understand or interpret Scripture accurately apart from the climax. The climax, what Jesus has done, has to do with every single bit of it, and uh, we're going to learn more how to do that as we go. But Here's another reason to view the Bible as one big story, the meta narrative. Let's take the New Testament, for example. We know that the New Testament does contain instructions for us to live by, right? But what we usually do is that we take those instructions, those New Testament instructions, as ways for us to either gain God's favor, get more of his blessing, or um, make him happy with us. It's this, if I do this, then God will do this mentality. Which again, that is an old covenant formula. If you do this, God will do this. That is an old covenant principle that does not work under the new covenant. 
Because what we are doing then is we are looking at instructions for ways to us to gain some type of leverage with God. We're looking at those in order to solve the conflict, right? Well, the conflict has already been resolved. I mean, Jesus has secured all the blessing and all the favor of God we're ever going to get. And so following these instructions is not going to gain for us more than what Jesus has already purchased for us. Um, so that's what the following action means. The conflict has already been resolved. And so to, the way to gain those things is through Jesus, not through our good behavior and our obedience. Um, if that was the case, then it wouldn't be a new covenant. This would just be Old Covenant 2.0, right? I mean, it's a, a slightly altered version of the same thing. The New Testament instructions need to be viewed as because of, not for. And so Paul says, do these things here. We do these because we already have God's favor, not for his favor, right? Because the conflict has already been solved, not in order for me to solve more of the conflict. You can't do that. Um, and so it's not in order to be right with God, live this way. No, it's because you have been made right with God. Now live this way. And so one way puts the focus on us. If I do this, I'll get this in return. The other way puts the focus on Jesus. Because of what he has done, I now can. And that's the thing. So if the old covenant principle was, if I do this, God will do this. The new covenant principle is, because Jesus has done this, I now can do this. So, all right. So that's basically all the information that we go over in the first uh, session of this. I know it's a lot, but it's really just being able to view the Bible as one big story, you know, and seeing how those five parts of a story that Gustav Freitag discovered in the 1700s, God had already come up with it in his big story here in the Bible, you know. So anyway, y'all have any questions? What Anything jump out at y'all in, in any of that? Um, the marriage covenant that you were talking about, you know, if you lived the single life while you were in the new covenant of marriage, you were talking about that, and uh, I just noted here, you can't completely and truly enjoy the gift of the new covenant, the gifts of it, and the blessings of it, if you're still operating in the old covenant. Right. I mean, that's even a marriage covenant. I yeah. mean, God has given us the marriage covenant for, you know, pleasure and gifts and blessing, and, and we wouldn't be able to enjoy those things if we were still living yeah. in a single covenant. And so Parting with your buds at right, night, you wouldn't be enjoying. Such a yes, good example. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, That's true. Wrote that down. I just love the whole idea that Jesus can be found from the very beginning mm -hmm. uh, all the way to the end. I mean, he's, he's in it. Every scripture is to do with that with him. Yeah. I think you should show your illustrations. I... I was working real hard on some illustrations over here, but that's for the next class. That's for your testimony. It's my testimony. All right. You know, one thing to me, though, is to be able to see the Bible like this. It's so freeing, you know? That's, that's yeah. exactly the word that comes to my mind when I'm looking back over this because I, I was raised in a culture where you view the Bible as an instructional that's manual. Right. Mm -hmm. And my gosh you might as well quit after the first day because there's no way that you can ever live up. Mm -hmm. It was created that way. Yeah, you can't do it. I mean, and I spent years, I got to do this, I got to look like this, I got to talk like this, I got to think like this, I got to act like this, and my gosh, that is so debilitating. It is. It takes the wind out of your oh, side. It destroys you because yeah. you can never live up to that. You continually find yourself in this cycle. Uh, got to start over again. Yeah. Here we go. I yep. messed up yesterday, so let's start over again today. Another do-over. But And I think that's exactly why Paul, if you read through the epistles, what he always addresses his people is not what they've done, but reminding them who Jesus is. Yeah. And it just brings them naturally back to a place. Same way we're reminded what it means to be a son. It brings us right back to that place of our salvation. Like, thank you, Jesus, for doing something I can never do. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the freedom that lies in that, yeah. you know. Um, and that's all when I when I look through this and going through that's all I see is man the freedom yeah the freedom in that yeah my gosh thank you I don't have to live by a set of rules yeah because I would have messed that up in 15 minutes 
but because of Jesus, I can, you know, and it's just so much freedom in that. Mm -hmm. It is. Mm. And it makes you, it, it takes the burden off of you to try to be somebody that you're not. Yeah. And it, I don't know, it just, uh, I don't know, I love it. Well, it's just good true. stuff, you know. Yeah, good thing. If you've never looked at scripture that way, it just changes your whole mindset about who Jesus is. Yeah, it's true. So. And so what we're going to do, so here's how I view these, these sessions on these classes here. So today and part of next week, I'm giving you all tools. I'm putting tools in your tool bag, okay? And so these five parts is kind of looking at the story like this is a tool you can use. And, and so then after that, at the end of uh, the next week, we're going to take those tools and actually use them in, in you know, interpreting some of this. We're going to go through the Old Testament. We'll go through the New Testament. We'll go all over the Bible and apply these tools to it to find out what God is saying, what he is saying about Jesus to us. So uh, it's, it's really neat. And so I encourage you at home, uh, just take this, read your Bible, and, and you know, identify what part of God's story you are in that. And if you're in this part of the story, then what does that mean? And so how should you read that? And so do that. And if you have any questions, if you get stuck in any of it, something doesn't really make sense to you, uh, feel free to email us, call at the office. We are here from 9 to 1 or the office hours that we're keeping right now. And uh, so anyway, it's going to be good. And uh, we will see you all next week. Love you all. Bye.